And good evening. I'm Paul Vanderwerf, host for Ridgecrest Talk, Monday night with our guest, Steve Breckenridge, from the Agua Bonita Fly Fishing uh, Club, a local organization here in Ridgecrest. And we're going to be talking about fly fishing, which is a lot more than uh, people think. I always joke about the uh, river runs through it, Robert Redford movie, where the guy brings the can of worms. And that's kind of my approach to fishing. I'm not an expert. But hopefully with talking with Steve, if you're like I am, uh, you'll get some ideas of how to get better educated and learn more about fly fishing. So Steve, why don't you uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Agua Benita Fly Fishing. Well, Agua Benita Fly Fishers is a local fly fishing club. It was established in 1979 and has about 130 members. Um, I think we have five minors as members and about uh, 22 women that are members to the club. Uh, family memberships available. And we're here to promote uh, the education about fly fishing, uh, education about the conservation of the fly fishing wilderness. Uh, we're really concerned about habitat. And uh, we get together once a month and have a presentation. Um, some of our presentations have to do with where to fish. Some of them are uh, speakers come in and tell us about how to fish. And this month we'll have a speaker come in, uh, Phil Peaster from the Department of Fish and Wildlife. He's going to be giving us the uh, history of the uh, Heritage Trout Program and the recovery of the golden trout, which is what our club is named after. Agua Bonita is the Latin name for the California state fish, the golden trout, which is from our local, most local stream up in the Kern River drainage. So the club itself is, sit, is set up to, to promote fly fishing both to the community and to help ourselves learn how to be better fly fishermen, which includes the fishing techniques, making flies, and uh, even making rods. We have classes in all three. That's great to hear that you actually have the youth and a lot of ladies are starting to come out as well. Um, I used to golf in Hawaii where I met my wife and uh, we had a par three where she hit the uh, flag on her first uh, hit and we had to stop golfing after that. <laughs> my, my, uh, I just, I, my pride just couldn't handle her doing so well and I imagine if I'm out fishing some of these ladies are going to be doing the same thing. That's, that's kind of good to hear. Well, anytime we have a couple that shows interest in fly fishing, I always take the gentleman aside and say, I hope you realize your wife is going to learn three times faster than you are because normally the wives don't fish that much so they haven't picked up any of the counterintuitive methodologies of throwing pitching a heavy weight like you do when you're uh, casting a bass plug where you pitch the rod and the rod flings the weight and the weight pulls the line out in fly fishing the, the whole technique is you put a, a 30 40 feet of line out or 25 feet and the weight of the line itself bends the, the rod and gets the rod loaded. And then the weight of the line pulls the line further out. And obviously, if you've ever looked at a fly fishing fly, it only weighs one hundredth of an ounce, so it's not going to pull any line out whatsoever. So it's a whole different technique. Right. And that's actually an advantage if you're sitting at home saying, you know, I don't know anything about fly fishing, that's the person who's going to do the best because yes, they don't they have are. any bad habits. There are no bad habits, and they're going to pick up the technique, and they'll listen to you. Um, my wife was a good example of it. She decided that she wanted to learn fly fishing just so that she could do things with me. Ended up um, for about six years, she was an organizer of women's fly fishing on the West Coast and went to several uh, major symposiums. I would traipse along as the spouse and uh, have to go off to the, the knitting forums afterwards, except that luckily when she went to a fly fishing symposium, the, the stuff for the spouses was associated with fly fishing also. So the, the wife that was organizing would, would get her husband to organize a class for the, for the gentlemen that were being drugged to this women's only fly fishing symposium. Well now, the, the first thing you think of with, with fish is they have to be in water, and Ridgecrest has only had an inch of rain each of the last <laughs> two years. Uh, you're not going to be fishing at China Lake, on, on the Mirror Lake there. Where is it that people go fishing? 
Well, it's surprising. The, the closest place is an hour and 15 minutes to getting your feet wet. You can drive up what we used to call Nine Mile Canyon up to Kennedy Meadows and turn left at the store and go down to the bridge and fish on the South Fork of the Kern River uh, just above the wilderness area or you can even walk into the wilderness area or you can go straight when you get to the Kennedy Meadows store and go up into the campground and fish the South Fork and if you were willing to walk a quarter of a mile and the population of fishermen goes down by about 80 percent you walk a half a mile it goes down 95 percent you walk three quarters of a mile and you're by yourself and so then you can fish the problem we have this year is with the drought you need to carry a thermometer because trout are endemic to waters that are between 50 and 65 degrees is their ideal space to live and survive in and the afternoon water temperatures are beginning up above 65 degrees and it's really not conducive to the trout surviving if you're going to do catch and release to catch them at that high a temperature drag them through the water and then try to let them go and survive so all the f members of the fly fishing club we all carry a thermometer with us so we can water measure the water temperature and personally when it gets above 60 i quit fishing unless i want dinner then i'll catch then you're not throwing them back in then i'm not throwing it back in i'll catch one or two fish for dinner so if i'm checking with a thermometer what temperature Ideally, it'd be 60 degrees or maybe up to 65. So when it's getting up to about 65, then I know the water it's temperature shaking. is just too hot for the fish to survive. Now I went to one of these prospectors gold mining clubs, and nobody wanted to tell me where the place was <laughs> to find the gold. Is that the same thing with fishermen? Are you going to kind of tell me the secret spot, or is that something you have to learn through experience? Um, that that's the funny thing about fly fishermen. Um, if you express an interest in fly fishing, show that you have the ethic of a fly fisherman, that you're not going to stomp into the middle of the stream between two people that are fishing. Uh, we share quite a bit. Um, my favorite fit place to fish is up beyond uh, Kennedy Meadows and I drive another eight or nine miles up past Troy Meadows campground. And about a mile past Troy Meadows, there's a white spot where you can get the car off the road and into, under the trees so it stays cool. And that's called Fish Creek. It comes out of behind uh, Black Rock Ranger All Station. Right, we're going to have to go ahead and take a break. So Fish Creek is the first secret spot that we're sharing. We're going <laughs> to go ahead and go to a break here. This is Rich Crest Talk with our guest, Steve Breckenridge. Harrison. Okay, okay, mommy. Well, welcome back to uh, Ridge Talk. This is Paul Vandorf, your host. And uh, funny thing, last week somebody told me I was saying to drive north to get to Cal City. Obviously, you're driving south. And I was uh, introducing Steve with the wrong last name. This is Steve Garrison. Uh, forget whatever it was I had in my head. I don't know where that was coming from. I guess it was right there with my directions. And we were talking about fly fishing and that secret spot. And I remember with someone talking the same thing about hunting. If you know somebody who's a hunter who is respectful to the environment, you might share a spot. But if it's somebody who's just going to go in there and, and just tromp on everything, then they're real reluctant to share some of those nice canyons that are around here in the area. Um, you're talking about this, this great spot that you like to go. Um, what do I do and what does the community do when we want to find these great spots? Well, if you were to come down to a club meeting on the first Tuesday of each month, uh, we meet at 7.30 at the Methodist Church. One of the things that we have as a resource is a book called Fishing Around Here. And it was written about uh, 10 years ago by one of our club members who was an extensive backpacker. And so he wrote up every trip that he ever took fly fishing. And he always had a fly fishing rod with him. Uh, he and his wife uh, walk and hike all the time. Um, so we have that book available. And one of the reasons he, he did it and one of the reasons we're so willing to share is if you look at the amount of fish available per acre foot of water in California, 
the best place in all the state of California for the most fish for the number of square feet of stream is the Eastern Sierra. We've got the most water that flows the most steadily and we also have the most number of planted fish. And so there's more fish planted in the Eastern Sierra for the average fisherman to get out there and catch several fish than anywhere else in the state of California. Now when you say planted fish, what do you mean by planted fish? <laughs> planted fish are raised from eggs in a hatchery. Um, they bring them up to a catch size of somewhere around a half of a pound and they put them out there very specifically for families and fishermen to catch and have the joy of catching a fish in the wild. They're not a native trout to that particular stream. In fact, in the Eastern Sierra, the only native trout is in the Kern River and it's the Agua Bonita golden trout. The rest of the Eastern Sierra historically was uh, denuded of any sport fish. So all the sport fish that are in the Eastern Sierra, uh, the brown trout, the rainbow trout, the golden trout, the, the um, brookies have all been planted at one time or another over the last century. So the native browns actually were planted also? Yeah. The I ones that breed that here are originally from, there was two locations that they brought the eggs in from. One was Loch Leven in Scotland and the other was from a, a stream in Germany. So there's the German brown and the Loch Leven brown. Well, that's and good to so know because I always thought the brown was now, the native. Yeah. Well, in fact, the brown trout isn't even a trout. Technically, it's a somalid, and it's a part of the char family. And so it, it, one of the reasons it was planted is because it can't crossbreed with trout. So the agua needed the, the Oncaricus micus, which is the, all the trout that live on the west coast of the United States, east of the, west of the Rockies. There we go. And <laughs> west I'm of the Rockies are, are one subspecies of fish, and they can't crossbreed with browns. So the browns, the only problem they have with brown trouts being introduced is they're voracious and they eat little fish like you wouldn't believe. And so if they get too big, then they can lower a population because they eat all the youngsters. Now you're talking about some things are counterintuitive or they go opposite of what you would think. And one of the things a friend was telling me as a hunter, he said that the hunters are often some of the most responsible people in taking care of an environment in an area because they want to make sure that that wildlife continues. And I'm starting to get the same sense the way you're talking about fish, that the, the fisherman has a certain sensitivity to the environment. How is that coming along with this drought and that, how is that affecting our area? The drought here on the, on the Eastern Sierra is not affecting us as much as the rest of the state of California. The rest of the state of California has got a significant problem with the major streams trying to dry up and not being able to support their fish. But the biggest one that's come into recent mo recently is the um, Aquarium of the Pacific down in Long Beach. Just built a great big humongous aquarium, a brand new one, and they put steelhead trout in it. Because they discovered south of Santa Cruz, down to the Mexican border, there's about a population of 500 steelhead left. And they keep trying to come up the streams, like they'll try to go up uh, Malibu Creek. Of course, you know, when two fish, uh, steelhead, swim up Malibu Creek, their response is, damn. <laughs> that doesn't go very well. No, and there, the dam's been there since 1922, and it's, be, it's supposed to be torn out. When they tear it out, it will then give about 25 miles of stream bed for the steelhead to run up and breed. And the southern population of steelhead is very important because they breed in waters that get too warm, like I was mentioning, most of the trout like at 60, 65 or lower, they can survive in 70, 75 degree water even when they're only, you know, little tiny babies. Uh, they can wait around for three years before they have to get to the ocean to go out and get bigger to be what we consider a steelhead. Uh, they don't worry about the sporadic, they just find a place to live and so the stream stops flowing for a year and then they go down with the floodwaters down to the ocean. They're really concerned about this at Fish and Game because the gene pool of these 500 steelhead that are left, the rainbow trout, are different. Their gene pool is different. They like warmer water. They can live in higher, hotter climate and stuff. So they're going, hmm, if we really do have global warming, it might be nice if the rainbow trout that live on the Klamath River 
can get some of that gene introduced if the water starts getting warmer on the climate. And we've seen what happens when the water gets warmer on the climate, it kills all the fish. Right, because they're not used to they're that They're not used to that warmer water. But if they had the gene of the steelhead from Southern California, they might be able to survive. So what, how does this information roll down? It kind of comes from the scientists and the researchers down to the, the hobbyists? Uh, we would like to say that we're in the, the forefront of, of making other people aware of it. Um, yeah, the scientists with the fish and game and the scientists with the, uh, the different organizations at the universities and stuff are doing it at the cutting edge, but we're out there in the field. I mean, it was, it was fishermen that noticed that the High Sierra um, meadows were being completely denuded by the cattle. All right, we're going to have to go ahead and go to another break. Uh, this is Paul Vanderf with Rich Talk, and we're going to uh, continue with Steve Garrison from the Agua Bonita Fly Fishers uh, right after this break. Welcome back to Ridgecrest Talk. I'm Paul Vanderwerf, the host. Uh, this week we're talking fly fishing with the Agua Bonita Fly Fishing Group here in Ridgecrest. Uh, Steve Garrison is our guest. Uh, we've been talking about uh, the problems with the drought and the uh, environmental concerns, which uh, a lot of the terminology is, is new, uh, talking about steelhead and rainbow trout and understanding all that. But uh, there is actually a lot of local involvement and a lot for the kids. Why don't you tell us uh, what, what's going on with the kids? Uh, that how are they learning about this environment and the fish? Well, the Agua Bonita Fly Fishers has been doing a, a sponsoring a program called Trout in the Classroom for the last 25 years. In fact, my daughter was in the first class, and uh, we actually bring in trout eggs that we get from Department of Fish and Wildlife. I haven't got used to that yet, and uh, we set up a 20 gallon aquarium and set up a natural habitat and put the fish eggs in and the first problem we have is fish eggs like to be at 50 to 55 degrees so we have to to set up a chiller to go along with the aquarium so the teachers we usually have about 19 classrooms involved here and we've got the setups for each one of them and we set it up put the eggs in and then the teachers actually we have a resource that we provide to them and they can do add turn the wildlife and, and conservation into any part of their their uh, curriculum, and uh, it's all set around the stream as the the as the source of the conservation. So the, the, they teach different things on how to tell whether the the water is a good source of water by teaching about the aquatic insects and which aquatic insects can survive in the water and which ones won't and it gives you an idea of the quality of the water. Uh, they can teach about uh, a riparian habitat and how that if it's shaded, it stays to the proper temperature so the fish are very healthy. But if you do clear cutting down to the edge, it gets warm and the fish all die out. Um, they can talk about um, the use by both farmers and cattle raisers and the natural fish and how to, to manage that so that the the cows don't ruin the stream by walking through it and increase, how do we say this, increasing the content of the <laughs> nitrogens in the, the streams. Nitrates. They put too many nitrates in it. So there, there's a whole set of curriculums. I had one teacher I was helping one year that for eight weeks, every lesson had to do with the trout in the classroom. The math was, do, was on on statistical analysis and data collection, and she actually had the kids calculate uh, how long until the eggs had hatched based on how old the eggs were and what the temperature of the class of the aquarium was, and they kept a monitoring of it. And they had this complicated scientific of how many therms the eggs were gaining and what day they would hatch on. They were right. The kids had it right down to the day that the eggs would hatch. Yeah, and and I, then when they're done, we take them out in the field and let them plant the fish in the natural stream. 
Right, and we had uh, Billy Reynolds from Teaching Kids to Fish, who I think is in his second year with that program. They went up to the Upper Kern River and released some of the fish, and yep. they had some pictures of those kids. You can just see everything come to life when you're actually seeing something. I remember going to high school here in Burroughs and studying the Civil War, and I was just like <laughs> bored to tears. And then I went back east, and I went to the Battle of Gettysburg, climbed yes. up and looked around the battlefield, and all of a sudden it became real interesting. Yes. And so we don't have a Battle of Gettysburg here, but we have... Uh, like the Kern Crest Audubon Society have, we have all these birds that migrate right through this area. And what I'm hearing now is, is all these waterways and all these uh, natural uh, insects and, and all these fish are all in an area here that, that is much greater than you're going to have in the rest of the state. Yes. And so, like I said, it's an hour and 15 minutes up to the Kern River, but you can just start going north. and. There are streams that most people don't even know about in the Lancia and Cottonwood Creek. Now, if you go up the, the top to the Cottonwood to uh, Horseshoe Meadows, there's uh, rainbow trout or, that are called the golden trout in the stream up there that was established by the guy that was had a sawmill up there at one time. He imported them from further south and set up a place where the golden trout we thought were native and they aren't. And so it's uh, where they collect all the eggs for years and years and years. Now they don't. But, um, but Cottonwood Creek, you just keep going and going and going. And Now you have, besides the meetings, you also have some events that you guys do. Do you have yes. any events coming up? Uh, we have a, an, an out. We just had an outing on the 11th. We went up to June Lake Loop and to Rush Creek. Uh, Rush Creek is one of our, we like to pat ourselves on the back. Uh, we helped the state years and years and years ago. We were one of the signatures that said, hey, change the law, change the law, change the law. And if, if there's trout in a stream, make it illegal to dry the stream up. Well, Rush Creek was dried up because the Grant Rail Lake sent all the water down to L.A. And we had a really wet year, and Grant Lake overflowed, and fish went with it. And all of a sudden, there's fish in Rush Creek. Now the, the city of water and power cannot stop the flow out of Grant Lake. They have to keep the, a certain minimum flow so that the fish that washed out of the lake are now living in the river or in the creek have to be maintained. Right, and I've been hearing from our friends up in Owens Valley how some, it's not just how much water flows, but they need to have a surge at the right time of the year and all these things that relate to the, the, uh, the cycle of, yes. of repopulation and all of those and different things. And cleaning the silt out, and so the storms are, are actually good. Uh, they actually clean out the silt, and the reason you worry about the silt is one can the aquatic insects live on the bottom? They can't if it's too silty and Can the eggs survive because that's where trout lay their eggs is on the bottom if it's too silty It buries them down and they smother so There's two different things the reason you want it to have Clear cobble and the right size of gravel in the bottom of the stream just to keep the stream alive Right, and it looks like we're just about getting ready to wrap up, but the real key to all this is how do we bring our watchers at home to get actively involved? And it looks like we have some meetings where you can get to know people. We have a book that shows them really great places to go here in the area. Uh, we had um, Joe Chesney from the uh, Eagle Rafting up at the Kern River, and one of the ideas there was you go up and you get familiar with the area with a tour, and then you branch out and go out on your own from there. And that sounds like a, a great idea for Agua Bonitas. You can get involved with a group, and then you can start to branch out on your own. I also wanted to uh, mention with our local garden club, the Oasis Garden Club of Indian Wells Valley, we're going to have a plant sale. The fall plant sale is September 27th from 8 a.m. to 1.30. That's out at the fairgrounds. They have that twice a year. And that's pretty much a wrap-up with Agua Bonita Fly Fishers. Your host, Paul Vanner, with Ridgecrest Talk. Thank you for tuning in.